Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Rashid Khalbi. Uh, I'm one of the founders of the Center for Palestine Studies. I'm the Edward Said Professor of Modern Arab Studies at Columbia. And I will be your host for the very beginning of this program, after which I will hand over to my colleague, co-founder of the center, Professor Brink Messick. Um, <clears throat> welcome to what we have called Readings in the Khaldi. Um, this is a session co-sponsored by the Center for Palestine Studies, which this year is celebrating its 10th year of existence. It is the first and so far only uh, such institution on the North American continent uh, within an American uh, university. It's also co-sponsored by the Center for Muslim Societies at Columbia University, as well as the Columbia University Library and the New York University Library. So NYU and Columbia Libraries are both involved in co-sponsoring this event. Um, this series of readings was launched in the fall on October 5th with a general introduction to the Khaldi Library in Jerusalem, the Khaldi. Uh, most of the people today will be calling it the Khaldi, which is what's called in Arabic. Uh, and a discussion of the recent digitization of the manuscripts in the library by the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library. Um, there is a Zoom recording posted on the CPS website. Um, and there is also a very good website of the Khaldi Library itself, which I think also carries the, uh, the recording. Today, uh, we're going to start a series of readings based on the library's holdings. Uh, the session will also provide a general overview of the phenomenon of the regional library as an institution, and it examines some distinctive features of the Khaldi, of, of the Khaldi Library. Um, today, we are fortunate to have two people presenting. Uh, we will start with a lecture by uh, Professor Conrad Hirschner, who is a leading scholar on regional libraries, such as the Khaldi, uh, who's going to speak to us on the topic of libraries in the late Ottoman and post-Ottoman Bilad Shem the Jerusalem Khaldiya Library in context. Um, <clears throat> professor Herschler is a full professor and the director of the Berlin Graduate School of Muslim Cultures and Society. His research focuses on Egypt and Syria in the Ayyubid and Mamluk periods, so from about 1200 uh, till about 1517. Uh, his books include a seminal study uh, entitled The Written Word in the Medieval Arabic Lands, a Social and Cultural History of Reading Practices, which was published by Edinburgh University Press in 2012. He's also written several other books focused on specific libraries, the most recent of which is A Monument to Medieval Syrian Book Culture, the Library of Ibn Abdelhead, uh, published by Edinburgh, again, Edinburgh University Press in 2019. We're very fortunate uh, to have, uh, uh, in response to Professor Hirschner's lecture, uh, comments by Ahmed, Professor Ahmed Shamsi. Uh, uh, professor Shamsi is an associate professor in uh, one of my old departments at the University of Chicago, the Department of Near East Languages and Civilizations, where I taught very happily for 16 years. Uh, professor Shamsi's works include the canonization of Islamic law, a social and intellectual history, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 2013. And more recently, um, directly on the topic we will be addressing today, uh, rediscovering a book entitled Rediscovering the Islamic Classics, How Editors and Print Culture Transformed an Intellectual Tradition, which was published by uh, Princeton University Press in 2020, and which has chapters on both traditional and modern uh, libraries in the Islamic world. Uh, following uh, Professor, Professor Hirschkin's last lecture and Professor Shamsi's comments, uh, we will open the floor for discussion. Once again, uh, welcome uh, to a talk on libraries in the late Ottoman and post-Ottoman Bilad Yashem, the Jerusalem Khaldi Library in, context, in Context by Professor Conrad Herschel with comments later on by Professor Ahmed Shamsi. Thanks, everybody. Conrad. You're muted, Kim. Muted. Professor Ashley, you should unmute. Okay, sorry. Um, thank you very much um, to the Center for Palestine Studies for the invitation to present here today in the series on the Khalidiyas Library Manuscript Collection. And thanks to Professor um, Khalidi for this kind introduction. And it is a great pleasure to be part of this series aiming at bringing the Khalidiyah into the focus of a new generation of scholars. 
And the last meeting in the series, the first meeting which um, Professor Khalidi mentioned, brought together numerous colleagues who certainly have a much stronger affiliation to the library, especially Khada Salame, Nazmi Jorbe. And what I will say on the Khalidia is very much based on their work, as well as the work of others, such as Walid Al Khalidi and Lawrence Conrad. And I guess this is also the point to acknowledge the efforts of the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library in making this collection available open access, which is more or less the reason why I've been able to give this talk today. What I want today are two main things where I see a chance to contribute something new. Firstly, I want to contextualize the Khalidiyah within the broader landscape of libraries in the Ottoman and post-Ottoman Bilad Isham, a field that has seen important advances over the last year, i.e. the field of library studies. And in the course of this discussion, I will suggest ways of how we can see the Khalidiyah as part of the larger transformation of this landscape in the course of the 19th century. And then in the second part of this talk, I will suggest on the basis of this contextualization venues for future research in order to show the extraordinary potential of the Khalidiyah to contribute to the wider field of library studies. And here I will suggest different possibilities of how such renewed research might be conducted. So to start with the first part, the contextualization of the Khalidia in its late Ottoman environment. As is known, as is very well known, the origins of the Khalidia library go back to the 18th century when Mohammed Son Ala the Elder established what is today seen as the foundation stock of the library when he transferred over 500 books into a family endowment. I.e. this was a family work and the books were to stay in his home according to the endowment provisions. This endowment was subsequently enlarged by his son, Mohammed Son Allah the Younger, also very well known, and another female family member, Tarafanda, to whom we will return to in the second part of this talk. This foundational stock was in turn enlarged by subsequent generations of the Khalidi family, wherein one has, whereas one has to say, and this will also be in the focus of the second part, that there are still large section of this history of supplementary endowments in needs of future research. The Khalidi family was obviously part of the group of local notables who quite often were translocal notables within Ottoman Jerusalem and within the wider Ottoman Bilad Sham. And this group played a decisive role in setting up new libraries and stocking existing libraries with additional books. And this is that's what we see here by Mohammed Sun Allah was part of a much broader practice among the notables, especially of the 18th century. And we will return to the 18th century over and over again in this talk. Um, among the libraries in Jerusalem, we have, for example, the library established by Mohammed Al Khalili, who belonged to the same generation as Sun Allah and who endowed more than 600 books. Again, this was a family work, but the, book, the books were deposited in a madrasa the Baladir Madrasa. Another important Jerusalem library coming out of this milieu of notables was Abu Saud Daoudi, a library which was set up in the late 17th century, just one generation before the two previous libraries, with initial stock of 300 books, again, family endowment, and in this case did also not stay in the private home of the family, but moved into an institution, in his case, the Fakhriya Zawiya, which is the current Islamic museum around the corner of the Khalidiyah. And among the most important family libraries of the 18th century was the endowment set up by Mohammed ibn Budayr that is extant today in a reconfigured form as the Budayriya library. Again, family endowment. And in this case, the books remained also in the private dwellings as much as it was the case for the Khalidiyah. I spare you the details on all the other libraries that were set up by the notables of Jerusalem in the 18th and early 19th century. What I want to convey is that the cultural practice of establishing endowment libraries was widespread in the town, especially in the 18th century, and that the Khalidiyah library was only one part of a highly bookish culture in Jerusalem. And the high number of books that circulated within the urban topography of Jerusalem in that period is not only evident from the library endowments, which we have just seen, but even more from the estate inventories that we find in the Sigilat of Jerusalem. If we look at the Sigilat from the 17th, 18th, and 19th century, we see again and again how many books were found in the houses of private individuals. And on the basis of these estate inventories, 
Bashir Barakat has identified well over 10,000 books that were in family libraries during the Ottoman period in Jerusalem. To take just a very brief step back, I can't spare you that, um, a brief look at the Mamluk period, my main um, area of research. Um, we don't know too much about the book culture of Jerusalem during the Mamluk periods because we just don't have a comparable documentation. But together with my colleague Saeed al-Jumani, I'm currently working on this document from the Mamluk period, which is the earliest insight that we get into a family library in Jerusalem. That's by somebody called Burhan al-Din al-Nasari, who's otherwise completely unknown. He's never mentioned in a chronicle or biographical dictionaries, but his estate was sold in a public auction. And this sale booklet is part of the Haram al-Sharif corpus of Mamluk documents, again, just around the corner of the Khalidiyah in the Islamic Museum on the Haram al-Sharif. This Burhan al-Din did not live very far from the Khalidiyah, other side of Jerusalem. And even though he was a rather average individual about whom we know hardly anything, he had more than 300 books in his house. And from the document of the sale of his estate, we are able to show that after his death, these books went into the houses of more than 70 buyers across the urban topography of Jerusalem, who in turn enlarged their private libraries. Okay, this just as a very short excursus to show that the bookish world of private homes in Ottoman Jerusalem was a feature that we see reaching far back into history, but we only get very limited insights into this world of high-speed book circulation. If we now return to the Ottoman period, but widen our perspective beyond Jerusalem and take the wider Bilal Sham into consideration, we see that during the Ottoman period, the very vivid library scene that we saw for Jerusalem, especially in the 18th century, existed in the other main cities as well, including Akka, where the governor, Ahmed Pasha al jazad built up his considerable library, then it included valuable manuscripts, such as one of the most important copies of Ibn Anadim's Fikhris, which is today held in Dublin. Our knowledge of these Ottoman period libraries across Bilad Sham is still very limited. And this is only a research field that is starting to emerge. But we have some recent wonderful work in that regard. For instance, on Aleppo, we have the recent article by Feraz Krimsti on a private library from the 18th century. We have the book by Said al-Jumani on a madrasa library at the very end of the Ottoman period and the forthcoming article by Benedict Raya on another private library of Aleppo. But the best comparator, comparator for, the, for this talk on Jerusalem is Damascus, for the simple reason that the library history of that city is relatively better known, even though there are still vast areas that await exploration. The library scene of Damascus developed along quite similar lines to that of Jerusalem, in the sense that the 18th century was a vivid period of setting up new libraries and that local notables played the crucial role in this process. In Damascus, these were in particular, not very surprisingly so, the library endowments by members of the al azm family, such as Abdel al azm Ismail al azm Suleiman al azm and so on. But also numerous other families and individuals endowed their book collection in various sites across the city. And as you can see here, all these Damascene Ottoman period endowments visible to us today were made an institution in Madrasas. So, in sum, the foundation of the Khalidia Library and its subsequent development has to be seen as part of the highly bookish world of Ottoman notable families and their cultural practices in Bilat Sham and clearly well beyond that, but also socially not only limited to the notable families, but also evident in other sections of society. However, we only have very limited insights into the actual world of these private libraries, i.e. what books exactly were on their shelves, how did the book holdings develop over time? Who were the users? And so on. And this is especially the case because many of these libraries disappeared in the course of the late 19th and early 20th century. These family libraries which have disappeared are sometimes known to us because documentary evidence survives. Sometimes we have endowment deeds and in many, many other cases, we have ownership notes on the manuscripts that once belonged to specific libraries. Manuscripts that are today dispersed across holdings of libraries in Jerusalem and libraries worldwide, such as the Al Jazar manuscript from Akka that we have seen 
which is today in Dublin. In Jerusalem, for instance, the books of the former Al Khalidi collection have to a large extent been absorbed by the Al Aqsa Library. And the task to identify all these manuscripts in order to rebuild the holdings of this library, so to say, is still to be carried out. And in addition, there are numerous private libraries that have disappeared completely, that are currently hardly known to us at all. Libraries that have disappeared, but that had been part and parcel of the library landscape of cities, such as Damascus in towns such as Jerusalem. And it has to be said that the density of private and adult book collection in Damascus, Aleppo, Akka, Jerusalem, and other towns was part of trans-regional networks of book circulation, which evidently included Constantinople and Cairo, places to which books gravitated, but also places from where books were brought to Jerusalem. And within the Khalidia library itself, the very strong flavor of Cairo is best expression of this embeddedness of Levantine book culture in trans-regional networks. And just as an aside also, in this talk, I limit myself to libraries with a predominantly Muslim profile, but it is clear that across Bilat Asham, we also have to add numerous libraries of Christian and Jewish owners to the tableau. That so many Ottoman period libraries are hardly visible to us today very much depends on the development of libraries in the Middle East, in the entire Middle East, in the second half of the 19th century. So that's the other crucial period. The 18th century as the building period, so to say, and the late 19th century as a period which has complicated our task as historians fundamentally. This is because three group of actors started to play a crucial role in the topography of libraries and books collections. And this change in the cultural landscape of the region in turn entailed a profound reconfiguration of patterns of book ownership and of the shape of libraries. One of these actors who started to play a much more intensive roles were European manuscript traders. Obviously they had been there before, but they start to be there in a much more intensive way um, intensifying what Ahmed Ashamsi has called the book drain to Europe, um, which had started much earlier. The second new actor in the topography of libraries was the Ottoman state, that in the second half of the 19th century increasingly started to claim the right for custodianship over cultural artifacts. And this new claim was to some extent also a reaction to the first development, i.e. the increased role of European trading networks in buying manuscripts and removing them from the Ottoman lands. The increased role of the Ottoman state in the cultural field was part of a twin development. On the one hand, it was simply the result of a state which was expanding its position in society at large. But it, it was also a result of the transformation of how the handwritten book was seen. The handwritten book had simply been a kitab until the 19th century. But during the 19th century, it was transformed into a distinct cultural artifact, no more commonly called maktub, and that thus needed to be protected. In Damascus, this development led to the foundation of a veritable state library in 1880, the so-called public library, al maktab al Amumir, that later became, became known as the Dahiriya, and was merged in the 1980s with the Syrian National Library. This library absorbed the endowed libraries of the city, among them the libraries of the Al Azm family that we find today distributed across the shelf marks of the Syrian National Library. Yet the changes in the second half of the 19th century did not only come from above and from the outside, but we see that local actors also played an active role in these developments, and that's certainly where the Khalidi family comes in, and another paradigmatic paradigmatic name in this regard is the scholar and reformer Tahir al-Jazairi, who played a crucial role in setting up the Damascus Library, and Ahmed obviously discusses him in detail in his book. Al-Jazairi and like-minded scholars and intellectuals played a crucial, crucial role in transforming the library landscape in the late 19th and early 20th century. But obviously the borderline between government actors and local actors was obviously very blurry, and Al Jazairi was often acting in the name of the Ottoman state when reorganizing libraries all across Bilal Esham. Within the large scale reconfiguration of the library landscape during this period, 
only two libraries were founded in all of Bilal de Sham that had the explicit title of public library. And that is the library in Damascus and the Khalidia Library of Jerusalem. Even though these two libraries resemble each other outwardly in name, they were the result of very different processes. The Damascus Public Library was primarily the product of de wakfization where the state de facto appropriates endowed objects with a claim to make them available to wider audiences, which were now called public, and to protect what were increasingly becoming cultural artifacts. The Khalidiyya is the result of a very similar ethos of funding a modern public library, as was expressed in this announcement of the establishment of the library from 1899, a document that has not been published so far. Yet, in contrast to Damascus, the endowed objects, the books, remained part of an extant endowment in Jerusalem, and the collection underwent much less of a physical restructuring than what happened to the former endowment libraries in Damascus. This well-known and by now iconic photo of the opening of the library with Rared al-Khalidi and Tahir al-Jazairi captures only the final stages in this process of transforming the family endowments into a public library during the preceding years. What we thus see in the second half of the 19th century is a massive reconfiguration of book ownership in Bilal de Sham and a profound reconfiguration of the cultural practices associated with book ownership. And in this process, many of the existing libraries were merged into larger libraries, they were dismantled, they were sold to new owners, new owners within Bilal de Sham, within the Middle East, just to mention Ahmed Kaimur in Cairo, and to new owners beyond the Middle East in Europe and the US. And this whirlwind of reconfiguration continued in the 20th century and hit especially hard the Palestinian collection with the Nakba of 1948 and the 1967 war. The main challenge for those of us interested in studying historical libraries in order to study social history, cultural history, intellectual history, economic history, the main challenge is this far reaching reconfiguration of book collections since the mid 19th century that has obliterated many libraries and smaller collections. De facto, we now have to embark on numerous projects of library archaeology in order to understand what books were once in a specific library. And that requires painstaking work of examining ownership traces on manuscripts. And Boris Liebrens does very important work in that regard in the framework of the Bibliotheca Arabica project in Leipzig. Such vanished libraries in need of library archaeologies include, for instance, the Uthman al-Kurdi Library of Damascus, just to take a random example. We do not even know who this Uthman al-Kurdi was. We do not know what books he endowed, as his collection was entirely absorbed by the public library. So the importance of the Khalidiya Library really goes back to the fact that it is an outlier in the wider landscape of libraries in Bilat Sham and the Arabic Middle East. Its importance goes back to it being the only known library reaching back to the heyday of Ottoman Library Foundation in the 18th century Bilal de Sham that has had a relatively, obviously relatively, but which has had a relatively continuous existing until this day. And the closest partner in this regard, and that's very interesting, is the Buderia Library in Jerusalem that also displays a high degree of continuity. Okay, this Basically, special case of the Khalidiyya does not mean that the Khalidiyya remained unaffected by the massive changes of the late 19th century. Here we see, for instance, a manuscript from the Berlin Library. This manuscript was sold to Berlin by the Swedish scholar and manuscript trader Carlo Landberg. On its title page, we see the note of a certain Ibrahim al-Khalidi. And this manuscript most likely had once been part of his family library i.e. it is a typical example of one of those manuscripts that was brought to Europe in the course of the 19th century, a typical example of how the changes of the 19th century also affected the profile of what we see today in the Khalidiyya library. And this notes bring me to the second and don't worry, shorter part of my talk. Um, because on the one hand, this note shows the embeddedness of the Khalidiyya library in the wider transformation of the 19th century, the aim of the first part. But this note also brings up a second issue, which will be at the center of the, at the, center of the remainder of this talk. Namely, 
that the developments in the field of library history and book history over the course of the last 20 years now offer the chance to study the history of this library, of the Khalidiyya library, in a much more granular, in a micro-historical perspective, so to say. So what I want to do now is to show areas of the history of the Khalidiyya library that have considerable potential to show its outstanding importance for understanding the wider history of book-related practices in the Ulaid Sham. This Ibrahim, for instance, is not mentioned in the histories of the library so far in any um, substantial manner, and he's absent from most family genealogies. I mentioned in the beginning of this talk that Mohammed Sun Allah, the elder, established the first endowment, well known. His son, Mohammed Sun Allah, established the second endowment, together with a female family member called Tarafanda. This Tarafanda is sometimes called the wife of Mohammed Sun Allah, which is wrong. And this is an incomplete version of the story, as these books of the second endowment originally belonged to this Ibrahim, whom we just saw in Berlin. This Ibrahim is also a son of Mohammed Sun Allah, the elder, and he was the husband of this Tarafanda. After Ibrahim died, his books were shared as inheritance between his wife Tarafanda and his brother Mohammed Sun Allah, the younger. His widow and his brother in turn then endowed the books to the existing endowment of Muhammad Sunala the Elder. The brother and the widow are thus in legal terms indeed the endowers, but the profile of the second collection really goes back to Ibrahim. And indeed, we find notes by Ibrahim on manuscripts all over the Khalidiyya collection. And he certainly deserves a much closer study as he played a crucial role in building up a large scale book collection. Here we see him, for instance, copying this manuscript in Cairo, in Al-Azhar. Or here, another of his manuscripts, we see him buying books from the sale of estates in Jerusalem. On numerous manuscripts, we furthermore find the seal of Ibrahim with which he claimed ownership. I.e., there is enough material to reconstruct the personal library of this late 18th century notable and the role of this personal library in the formation of the Khalidiyya collection. The Khalidiyya has this outstanding importance for studying the history of libraries in Bilal Sham and beyond because of its continuous existence as a group of family endowments and the subsequent merger into one public library. Yet the example of Ibrahim shows that the diachronic formation of this collection still deserves much more attention. The question of sub-collections such as the one by Ibrahim is part of a broader interest in the incoming stream of books that were added to the Khalidiyya, often via supplementary endowments, and also an interest in the outgoing stream of books that went to other collections, such as Berlin. And this is part of a project of studying the Khalidiyya library that I'm currently undertaking with my colleagues Firdaus Krimsti and Saeed al -Jumani as it is evident that the stories of what books are in the library are much more complicated than a linear line from the 18th century via the year 1900 to the present. One document that shows such complicated story is the oldest extant catalog of the book endowments by members of the Khalidi family from the late 18th century that lists basically these two endowments, i.e. by Mohammed Sun Allah the Elder and the subsequent generation. This catalog has not been edited yet, even though it is a central element in studying the history of this library. One could assume that we find here the foundation stock of what was to emerge as the public library in 1900. And indeed, we have the printed catalog of the Khalidiyya library in its 1900 shape, or at least of parts of the library in its 1900 shape. But if we compare the 1787 catalog and the 1900 catalog, we can see that the relationship is much less straightforward than one might imagine. Just two short examples. First of all, there's a very considerable number of books in the 1787 catalog that we do not see in the 1900 catalog and that we do not find in the present Khalidiyya library, such as this title, Anikaya by As Suyuti. So that was one of those titles which was either physically damaged beyond repair or that was taken out of the library and today sits in another collection somewhere in the world. Another example to show the mobility and fluidity of the book collection is this entry, the Minah al-Ghafar by al-Khatib at Tamar Pashi. This, was, this book was endowed by Mohammed Sunallah the Elder in two volumes in the 18th century. 
And these two volumes are in the Khalidiya Library today. And if we look at the actual manuscript as it is today on the shelves of the Khalidiya, we see indeed the endowment note by Mohammed Sundara the Elder. Wonderful, that's what we expect. We also see that the book stayed in the library in the next generation as his son put a note on it that he had read it. So at first glance, this seems to be a straightforward case of a book being continuously present in the collection until today. Yet this impression of a straightforward, continuous presence of the book in the library is complicated by the note below it. Here we see an ownership note by Musa al-Khalidi, a significant literary and religious figure of this period. Musa al-Khalidi was the grandson of Muhammad Sunala the Elder, i.e. of the one who had endowed it. So how is it possible that Musa claims private ownership of a manuscript which had been endowed by his grandfather? What must have happened here is that the book was taken out of the endowment, it returned to the book market, and Musa, who was a very avid book collector, saw the book, he understood it belonged to the family endowment, he bought it and he returned it to the collection where it has remained until today. So once we start to look at the individual trajectories of books, we will see a highly fascinating kaleidoscope of how complex the link between 18th century endowments and the modern collection is. And the Khalidiya precisely is so important because it allows us to conduct this study on account of its relatively continuous history. A study which for many other libraries is much more complicated and requires much more of a library archeology. span The importance of the Khalidiya as an extraordinary long lasting library thus offers a unique chance for an in-depth study. And this in particular is the case because we have an unparalleled rich group of different sources. Firstly, we have the manuscript notes of which I just discussed examples. Secondly, we have what I would call contextual documents. That is documents directly relevant to the development of the book collection that ultimately became the Khalidiya library. For example, the 1787 catalog or book endowment deeds or the 1899 announcement of the establishment of the public library and so on. While we have several Ottoman period libraries for which we have manuscript notes and contextual documents, to have them so condensed is quite rare. Yet there's more fascinating material to study the development of the Khalidiya library. Namely that the library functioned as a depository of family papers as kind of an archive. And there's no doubt that almost all Ottoman family libraries had this double function of book depository and archive. But in virtually all cases, these two collection, library archive, were separated in the late 19th century. And in the vast majority of cases, the library collection was, as we have seen, reconfigured. And the same goes for the archival collection. Yet for the Khalidiya collection, we have both library and archive preserved to an unusually high degree. Obviously there are many changes, but compared to the rest, it's unusual. And there's even more. Namely the fact that we have something which might be called a fragment collection. As is well known in 1987, during works on the roof of the library, it was discovered that some 10,000 leaves and fragments of manuscript and documents were deposited in a Geniza-like style in the space between the roof and the ceiling of the main library chamber. And among these fragments, we find for instance, documentary material, such as parts of dusters, dafters, that bear witness to the intensive role of members of the Khalidi family in 18th century book trade with Istanbul. And you can guess how important such material is in order to understand the bookish practices of this family and the contribution to the formation of what was to be the Khalidiya library. The vast majority of the material are not documents, but fragment and leaves of manuscripts that were most likely deposited there to be repaired or to be returned into the volumes to which they had originally belonged. But this is also of outstanding importance because all Ottoman period libraries featured such messy corners, as I would call them. But the problem is that this material has been lost or again, it has been separated from its original collection. In the Syrian National Library, for instance, we find numerous manuscripts that were reconstructed in the early 20th century from such fragments called dashed. 
The problem is that we do not know from where these Damascene dashed manuscripts, these fragments and leaves in Damascus were sourced from which library. So they are entirely decontextualized manuscripts for us. So we know very little of how librarians in the early 20th century proceeded to construct these new manuscripts. We know very little about their philological and codicological practices. The Khalidiyah library is thus a very rare case where we can still see this fragmentary material in situ and where we can link it to the original collection and its original setting. The study of these philological and codicological intervention in the case of the Khalidiyah is particularly interesting because we see in its collection many recreated manuscripts. And that's the last example I will bring before I come to an end. For instance, we find this manuscript of a commentary of the Makamat by Al-Hariri in the present day collection. On its title page, we see this note. This note says that the recreation of this manuscript was undertaken by Hussein Husni Al-Khalidi in 1891. And this Hussein Husni appears on numerous recreated manuscripts. He is clearly a crucial and not yet fully acknowledged individual who played a central role in developing the Khalidiyah into a public library, in addition to the well-known names of Ruhi al-Khalidi and Rad al-Khalidi. This process towards a library, a public library, that started well before 1900 is exactly where we see individuals as, such as Hossein Hosni starting to play a much more active role. So, while in many cases we have to take a very complicated approach of library archaeology to reconstitute at least some aspects of what an Ottoman period library looked like, the Khalidiya offers a very rare direct insight on account of a virtually unparalleled combination of source corpora that allow its history to make a major contribution to the wider field of Middle Eastern library studies. And with this point, I want to conclude my talk that hopefully has firstly shown in what ways the Khalidiyah was part of the wider development of Ottoman period libraries in Bilal Tashan, where we see new historical actors playing a crucial role in setting up a wide variety of libraries in the 18th century, and where we see that in the late 19th century, a group of other historical actors again profoundly changed this landscape of libraries. And I also hope that I've convincingly argued that the Khalidiyah offers a very rare opportunity to study a collection with a high degree of continuity and stability. This study, which we are currently undertaking, has to be conducted by integrating the rich contextual documentation that we have in terms of catalogues and endowments, and integrating the thousands of leaves and fragments of manuscripts and documents in the Geniza-like style depository, and most importantly, integrating the very rich archive of manuscript notes on the manuscripts themselves. And if I'm not mistaken, these manuscript notes will be at the top, will be the topic of the next talk in this series by Boris Liebrens. Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Conrad, for this wonderful talk. And I think it's um, it's a sign of how how exciting and how alive the kind of the field of of, uh, of library studies and and uh, uh, and the history of the book in the Middle East and uh, is at the moment, and and uh, how much progress has been made in in, in recent decades um, in. Uh, um, in, in the study of these fields, uh, I have to say, in in, in the Western world, uh, of course, uh, uh, Brink Messick's uh, uh, work on Yemen has been has been uh, um, uh, influential, but it's primarily really um, um, a kind of a, a European. I mean, you know, out, outside of the Middle East itself, of course, there's very significant work being done there, but um, uh, but it's 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 particularly Europe and uh, and, and Germany has has. Uh, uh, emerged as really one of the centers of this and it's uh, it's really exciting work to be done and and i think it's it's important that that uh, in the united states we we keep a connection to that to those developments because they're really important um they open up really important vistas that also connect the the modern and the pre-modern for example uh, in ways that um uh, that are enlightening for both so uh what i want to do in my in my in my short uh, comments i think uh, people are 
are already itching to ask questions from Conrad. Uh, but but what, what I wanted to kind of um, um, uh, do is kind of take the discussion a little bit later and 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 see how that can uh, influence our ideas about this um, uh, about the, the the age of manuscripts. Uh, and so I, I wanted to start with a, an anecdote from Chester Beatty, the uh, 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 Irish American manuscript collector, uh, um, I think mining tycoon and manuscript collector, and um, in in his library in um, in Dublin, they they run this documentary, this interview with him from the I don't know 60s or 50s, in which he talks about his uh, manuscript acquisitions and how he did this. And uh, of course, I mean we know he he, he uh, acquired these manuscripts through people like uh, uh, like Abraham Yehuda, for example, um, uh, and other people, but. Um, the story he tells is is a story of uh, a new generation of uh, of Arabs um, in the early 20th century who are faced with the inheritance of manuscripts from their forefathers and who don't really know what to do with them because they are in a world of print um, and um, they are either not interested in these uh, in these works or they don't even know how to kind of handle them how to consume them and that's why it is easy to buy them in a, in a um, in, 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 uh, for relatively, uh, uh, relatively cheaply, and then kind of uh, build up this. Uh, and if you go to the Chester Beatty Library, it's a kind of museum. It's a museum, right? It's not actually not a library, properly speaking, uh, for these artifacts, for these medieval artifacts. And so uh, I, I very much appreciate uh, what Conrad said that that basically the the, the introduction of print turned these art these these phenomena that used to be called just books that are written that happen to have been produced by hand into something called manuscripts um, that now uh, stood separate from the the, the mass-produced largely uh, uh, large body and growing body of of printed works and and uh, what is of course remarkable I mean we look at these numbers uh, of hundreds of manuscripts that these private libraries have uh, and they are, you know, they are. Depends what you what you want to compare them with. They they are uh, 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 very large compared to let's say medieval medieval European libraries. But with regards to modern libraries, they are not they're not large at all, right? Um, but uh, so within a few years or few few decades of uh, of print in the nineteenth century, um, the number of manuscripts is dwarfed by the number of printed works. And so suddenly you you manuscripts um, appear in a different light, uh, and they uh, and uh, they they become um, they become artifacts that have specific libraries dedicated to them. They they need specific types of care. Uh, uh, they are not. I mean, uh, um, they, they move from the realm of pure libraries from a place where you just go to the library and take them off the shelf and read them to something that is um, that is separated from the reader that you need special permission that you need special that are special uh, uh, ways of, of handling it uh, um, you know in, in around the year 1900 when in, in the Egyptian National Library you're not allowed to use ink wells anymore to copy manuscripts because obviously you you people stain the stuff. Etc. So that they become artifacts, um, but still, uh, the question I want to ask um, us is: um, Does this mean that um, pre-print manuscript culture was a manuscript culture in which, um, in which manuscripts were treated the way that we treat printed books today? And I have to say, I doubt that. Uh, and um, but it's it's a I find it's a difficult process to think yourself into. Um, into that moment, into that usage of manuscripts in the preprint world, and so one of the one of the uh, examples I have, I mean, uh, both in my book and generally, I'm more interested, I'm particularly interested in in, in classical Arabic works, kind of earlier Arabic works, and and their and their fate, and uh, you know, you showed this beautiful picture of the Fihris of Ibn Nadim from that was uh, from the Al Jazar um, uh, collection in in Akka that is now in the Chester Beatty Library, and. Um, you know, the question that I have in my mind is, you know, if you have such a, you know, if you have this book, why is it that it is an artifact that is in this library and we don't have a copy in each of these private libraries, right? Why is it that we have this, this old manuscript, but 
we have so relatively few copies. Why is it that when we have people who sell manuscripts, rather than saying, okay, I have a copy of this manuscript, I'm just going to have this copied and then sell those copies, right? Maybe that's too much of a capitalist uh, approach to things. Uh, saying, no, I'm going to sell this manuscript. So, I mean, that, that itself seemed to indicate to me that, um, and again, I mean, I've, I've looked in, in, in recent days, I've, I've looked at several of those, you know, both the Budeiri and the Khalidia library. And, you know, they're, they're, the, the, the older manuscripts, they're beautiful, and they're wonderful, but, you know, there are so few copies of them uh, that we can trace. Um, that it is like they, they already were artifacts, even uh, it seems to me, they already were artifacts, even in the purely manuscript age. Uh, and, and the question of, so how were then, how, you know, what does this tell us about usage? What does it tell us about those, uh, those notable families with their, with their family libraries that they did not then share um, these rare copies in the sense of, uh, they didn't share copies of them so that, that you have like a common body of, of, uh, uh, um, of works that everybody had uh, of, of the, of, I mean, of course there are some work that are, that are quite universally uh, uh, ex uh, 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 present in these libraries, but they're rel relatively late, late works. Uh, so, I mean, I, I wonder whether there already is a type of classicism uh, in which these old works function, especially the classical, the, the, the older works, 9th, 10th, 11th century works, already function as artifacts, even in these family libraries. And uh, as you say, the, 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 what, one of the great advantages of having these fa family libraries is that they are, in a sense, time capsules uh, into, um, into library practices from the pre-print age. And uh, in that sense, kind of uh, uh, preserve an image that, is, uh, that, is not, um, that hasn't been ravaged or, or at least you know, distorted by, by, the, by the influence of print and, and by the, by the you know, kind of modern, uh, uh, modern libraries uh, in, in the Arab world and their, their, uh, their collection practices. So uh, I think that, that that is one of the questions that, that would interest me uh, is w what is the relationship between works? Uh, what is the relationship between uh, what was the usage of these works in these libraries, and what can we see from uh, from from the surviving evidence? Um, how different types of works that survive in these libraries uh, were used uh, in various uh, periods of time. Um, I think I'm, I'm, uh, I've, I've gotten to the end of my uh, of my allotted time. I, uh, thank you very much. I I, uh, I want to thank the. Uh, uh, the center for for organizing these talks. I think this is incredibly important, and and it's incredibly important to also, you know, the kind of specificity of looking at a specific time and uh, a specific place, particularly, rather than speak about libraries in the Muslim world as if there is uh, such a universal thing uh, without uh, uh, p particularization. So uh, thank you very much for that, and I'm I'm looking forward to hear your question. I'm unfortunately going to have to leave. I have to teach. Uh, thank you, Professor Herschel. Thank you, Professor Shamsi. And I'll hand over to, to Brink. Bye-bye. So we'll, we'll take questions. Um, and um, in the Q&A and in the chat format, let's start with the Q&A, see what we can find. Uh, So uh, Raja Khalidi from Rashid's brother who in Al-Quds says that uh, the remnants of the rich library of the early 20th century traveler and scholar Sheikh Khalil Al-Khalidi are part of the Aqsa library collection. He's just making that note. Um, also, he notes that to Conrad, you can find an exhaustive genealogical uh, table or tree of Muhammad Sunallah and his descendants on the website, the new website. The new website of the Khalidi Library is really something special. Uh, maybe I'm sure you've both been there. But uh, uh, here's a, a comment by uh, Peter Koppens. Are there also sources available through which we can learn about the visitors, users of the library? To whom was it opened? Only for scholars or also for a general audience of literati? This would goes to some of uh, Ahmed's questions, I think, who consulted the available books. How and to what purpose 
Are there more e ego documents from visitors available like Qasimi's travelogue of his visit to Jerusalem and the library? Anyway, that's a, a couple of things on the table for, if you'd like to respond. Yeah, um, yeah. Th thank you very much um, for the Raja for the for the comments. Um, the Al Aqsa Library collection definitely deserves a very intensive study. I mean, that would be a wonderful PhD, which is just waiting to be um, written. And the formation of this library and thinking about the sub collections and the historicity of what we have today in the in the in the Al Aqsa um, Mosque. Um, as to the question, and then yeah, in the in the website, I mean, I, yeah. Um, it is really great um, how this has been revamped and the resources which are available there now. And also for this talk, I must say, I have pestered Raja and and then Khadr Salam quite a lot to ask, for example, for the announcement, etc. And they were kind enough to provide these documents. Um, so my thanks again for that. Um, as to the question of Peter, um, I guess I can take the first part and then perhaps, um, Ahmed, if you want to take over after that. Um, I, I mean, there is a visitor book which we have for the library, but that's obviously post-public library visitor book. Um, but that's um, running from the early 20th century. Um, that's on the website, I think, already. Yeah, that's, that is already on the website, or at least extracts, and it will be made available. And it's really fascinating to see, especially in the 1910s, 1920s, the people who have used this library, and you see a lot of the um, European scholars who come there. You see the scholars from the um, developing Jewish institution in Jerusalem to use this library. Um, but you also see um, intellectuals coming from neighboring um, regions, Egypt, um, um, northern Gilead Sham, who visited it. Um, as far as I know, nobody has done a study on this um, yet. I mean, it's not an enormous um, visitor book, but it's, I think, I mean, I don't have a visitor book for the Syrian National Library, so um, I think that's quite fascinating to have. As for the previous, basically, before the endowments were merged into the public library, um, that's a process which begins in the, as far as we can see, in the 1880s. Um, so let's say pre-1880 um, individual collections um, is a study which has not been done yet. Um, there's nothing contextual documents like a library. Um, visitor book or anything like that. These are these were sitting in the private houses of members of the Khalidi family. But still, you often have that these libraries play a role much beyond the immediate family, and that will be a task um, to be conducted on the basis of the reading notes um, and um, um, loan and, and and loan notes on the manuscript itself. The only thing which we have, and then I'm finished, sorry, um, is in the 1787 catalog, which we are editing in the moment, in the end, there's a section, there's a loan register. It's only a few pages, you know, it's not the 150 year run of all the books ever taken out, but at least, you know, there's a loan register. We haven't really had a look at it in detail yet, but we hope that this snapshot will give us an idea about the wider uses of this library within the ontography of Jerusalem. Ahmed, you wanted. Um... Yeah, I mean, th there's a there's a second uh, point about uh, kind of uh, print book culture that is that is useful here, which is to uh, to look for the for mentions of the Khalidiyah Library in uh, in journals and um, or, or in in, uh, in in published material, and uh, we find quite a bit, uh, as Konrad said, from the 1920s particularly onwards. Um, Yusuf and Nabhani, who is in Beirut, goes to Jerusalem and has a look at works. Um, Abdel Hay al Katani, all the way from Morocco, uh, comes and visits uh, the Khalidia Library and he mentions uh, some of its holdings. Uh, Mohammed Zahed al Kawthari, who's an you know, Ottoman um, uh, vice Sheikh al Islam, um, edits texts from the, from the Khalidia Library and publishes, publishes them in the 1930s. So uh, there is a, I mean, we obviously know there were scholarly networks before print. Uh, that uh, that exchanged information about these things, but with print you have uh, a kind of a, a public forum of journals within which these uh, these libraries also played a role. And and, and I think uh, especially I mean things like a like a catalog um, that didn't just exist at the library, but that was printed and that was ex that existed at other libraries. So that, that that automatically thereby created a network of knowledge. Um, that was shared uh, uh, across uh, both both uh, both Muslim lands and, and and into Europe, 
um, um, kind of publicized and, and, and made knowledge so much more accessible to people and, and it's much easier to trace th that way. We have a question uh, from Josh Mugler, who's from the Hill Library, the digitizers. Um, and he has a question about WACF, which was brought up and has many interesting aspects to it. Private walks, family walks, public walks, things like that. Anyway, his question, uh, was there significant pressure on the Khalidi family to dismantle their walk, in other words, their family walk, and turn it over to the state in the late 19th century, as you mentioned, occurred in Damascus? Was the foundation of the Khalidiyya as a public library a way to navigate such pressures? Um, yeah, um, thanks. I mean, to be quite honest, I don't know, and I'm not sure whether anybody else um, knows so far. That's one of the questions I'm particularly interested in. Um, it's clear that in Damascus, there was a massive pressure on libraries to be dismantled. Uh, there was a consistent strategy to delegitimize existing WACF libraries as outdated, um, irrelevant, and incompetent. Um, and thus to be transferred into what was then the state library. So in Damascus, there was, I mean, massive pressure and you really had to resist this pressure in a very in a systematic manner. Whereas in other cities, in Bilal el Sham, it doesn't seem that we have the same amount of pressure. If we look, for example, at um, Aleppo, not that we have a lot of studies on Aleppo, uh, no, I'm sorry, on Hammer, um, on Hammer, not that we have a lot of studies on Hammer, but it doesn't seem that there was the same pressure being exerted on centralizing the collection. And so I don't assume per se that basically in Jerusalem we have the same tendency. And the fact that basically the Bouderia Library in Jerusalem and the Khalidia Library in Jerusalem are the two most visible libraries which have a claim to relatively consist continuous existence from the Ottoman period, in my view, indicates that in Jerusalem the pressure was much lower, um, but that is something which, which we will have to look at in, in the um, process of, of this research. So um, we have a question from Islam Daya. Um, Conrad, you spoke about the library school buildings. Um, some, of the, some of the collections were held in madrasas, but the question, could you tell us a bit more about the relationship of, of libraries to the schools, the madaris? Were libraries built before the schools or vice versa? Were they supposed to serve the students and teachers of the school? Mm. In, um... Um, in Damascus, for example, the Abdallah al Azm, Ibrahim al Azm, Suleiman al Azm libraries, they were built, to, I mean, they were endowed more or less together with the schools, or they were, the books were endowed with a massive new endowment to an existing madrasa. They, they are really a moment where the school is either built or basically re restarted again. Um, whereas the um, at the Udi Library and the um, Mohammed Khalil Library, which I mentioned, which went into these um, Baladia Madrasa and the Fakhriya Zawiya, um, they are supplementary endowments at a later point. So they were meant to restock, most likely, a library which already existed um, and where these individuals wanted to provide additional books. And I'm not aware of a Jerusalem massive book endowment which was parallel to a madrasa foundation you know which is the typical damascus phenomenon you know I mean, that's how in damascus the, these libraries were normally founded you 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 build a madrasa and you 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 endow the books in jerusalem it doesn't seem to have been the same um the, the same process why that is so i'm not really sure um but that again speaks to the fact that, you know, the history of libraries is often a very regional affair and that you all see discrepancy within you know, 120 kilometers <laughs> from one another, very different ideas of how books and life and madrasas are linked. So it may, it, you mentioned Zawiyas and Madaris uh, as, as sites of these collections. What about mosques? Um, I mean, in the, the endowments which I have seen it's very rare to endow into mosques. In Damascus, you have the Umayyad Mosque, obviously, where you have a number of endowments made. They are well known. They have 
often retained their identity, they had their own cupboards um, in the Umayyad Mosque until the 20th century, um, they were visible. But um, the large Jerusalem endowments, um, I've not come across a large endowment specifically to the Al-Aqsa Library before the late 19th century. That seems to change. And then especially in the 20th century, it became more and more common to um, transfer book collections into the Al-Aqsa Library. Um, but for the 18th century, the heyday of, um, let's say, the Ottoman family endowment libraries, um, it seems that mosques were not really the main place to where endow one's books. Here's another question from Farid Rabawi. Rabawi. Uh, are there any insights, information on the becoming of the Geniza-like deposits underneath the roof of the Khalidiyah? Is, you know, we've, we've, there are things that happened like that in the Sana'a Mosque, the main mosque of Sana'a, mm -hmm. but there were Qurans up there in the rafters. Um, but so is there any, any, is there any kind of um, notion of uh, of why that place is the place of deposit. I mean, maybe it's maybe it's a a, a safe place in the interim. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, one must say. I mean, the 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 building where the where the Khalidiyah Library is today. That's only since the early nineteenth century, basically since the foundation of the public library. So it does not have a, you know, that's I, it's my own fault. I called it the <laughs> style like depository. So it immediately, you know brings up the association of, you know, something like for five, 800 years, etc. This is not the case, but this is a practice which we don't, I, mean, I don't know exactly. Um, and the best article on that issue is by Lawrence Conrad, um, published in 2000, who worked for three years on these fragments, um, specifically. Um, and he is not, I mean, he does not really know. So he believes at some point in the 1930s, 40s, these fragments, leaves were put into this deposit there. Um, that's perhaps something that Ja might be better <laughs> than me in a position to, to talk about. But for me, the main point is it's, you know, th this is the messy corner of a library. And probably because the public library is the result of fa several family libraries being merged in the late 19th century, then 1900 opening. And so the messy corner is um, the result of messy corners of family libraries being brought together. And that this is something which we still have in parallel to the manuscripts is really fascinating. Um, as I said, I mean, in Damascus, we can't link these fragments, the dust, which still exist. They're still there to some extent in the library. We can't link them to any library anymore. We don't know whether they came from the um, Abdel al or the Omaria or the Uthman al-Kodi library. It's decontextualized fragments. Could we just say something about the, the institution of the copy, the making of copies, the making of copies as student practices in, in education, the making of manuscript by professional scribes who are making versions of this how do how do we think about about copies? And here's a question from David Lelyveld. Um, you can you use statements in manuscript copies of copies by professional scribes that indicate the location of their sources? And are there practices, preprint practices, of comparison of text to establish some idea of authenticity? Mm -hmm. um. Ahmed, I mean, if, if you want to shoot in at any point, just, you know, just, just, just come in and, and interrupt me. Um, I mean, the, the, the um, professional scribes are very elusive to us. They are very difficult to capture. And that's um, in the Mamluk period, in the Ottoman period. Um, we are still struggling with the discussion. Do we have anything like a highly professionalized group of scribes in the 13th century, for example? You know, do we have it or not? I mean, it's, it's open. What we do know is that a lot of the copies which we have are made by scholars, you know, so that they basically sit down in a library and that they copy a specific work and that this is often linked to transmission and that's where authenticity comes in. So quite often, um, especially if you go to something like um, Hadith, but even in Tafsir and Fiqh, et cetera, you make a copy and then this copy is used for teaching purposes by the sheikh who basically is reading through your copy and has a check um, at it. And then in the end, a transmission is note is put on the copy where it is stated that a reading session was made on the basis of it or 
that a reading session was made on the basis of another manuscript, but that the sheikh, the authoritative teacher, certifies that the copy is identical. So, and I mean, that's something which you wouldn't find in, let's say, manuscript of mathematics, for example, this is not how it worked. But basically the, 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 the most prominent field of, of knowledge where you have that is in, in Hadith, um, where that was systematically done. And where you, you have a very clear process of making sure that a copy was authentic. Um, I mean, there, there's, I mean there, there's a question that isn't 100% clear to me. I mean, authenticity, um, is it about, you know, the authenticity of the text is attributed to the author? Like, is the whole text authentic or is it accurate? I mean, is it about accuracy? Um, there we find all kinds of different types of practices. Uh, you know, what, what is, I mean, um, we find this in, in Ottoman libraries. I haven't seen this. Um, I haven't seen this actually in Arabic libraries that there is um, uh, that, that there are catalogs in which specific manuscripts are noted to be reliable, so that you know that if you want to copy this, then that is the copy to go to. Uh, that that's a good asl uh, for for copying. It's it's early. I mean, uh, I, we see that like for I mean the, the Mahmudia Library in in, in Cairo and in, in Mamluk uh, era Cairo, where a lot of the uh, manuscripts were autographed. So I mean, clearly in that sense, there there, there is that there is that sense. But um, uh, in the sense that there is a, a universal standard of let's say having to. Uh, to consult various uh, manuscripts to make one copy, that's not necessarily there. I mean, obviously, there are examples of people doing this and, and noting variants on the, on the margins, but uh, it, that's not necessarily the, the, the practice of, of copying ma manuscripts. That's the practice of the Orientalist who, who makes the authoritative text and in, in the footnotes it has all the different manuscript variations. Don't 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 turn a, a critical philology into a into an Orientalist monopoly. I mean, that also existed, but yeah, I I, I, I see your point. But autograph manus manuscripts are, are have a, a certain kind of prestige and a certain kind of authenticity. We would say. And are, when when copies are made of them, do they say this is a copy of the khat the katib or whatever khat? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Raja has an answer to the Desh uh, papers. We would be happy to host any scholars who want to come and come over and dig in. It's a daunting task and requires the sort of manpower we don't have. This is Raja Khalidi from the Khalidiya Library in, in Jerusalem speaking. Um, let's see if I have another. Uh, Reem K asks, what mas masterpieces would we find in the Haladiya library? Can you give a few examples? Um, I mean, the, the um, Makamat al-Hariri, um, that's um, I mean, the Shah. It's, it's not the original <laughs> Makamat al-Hariri, um, but, but it's, um, uh, I guess it's a 15th century uh, manuscript, which is um, nicely um, written. Um, and there is, I mean, masterpiece. Obviously, if you if you look for old uh, material, um, one of the oldest um, is um, philological material by Ibn Duraid, um, Al Akbar Al Mansura. I think that's a manuscript which goes back to the 10th century, most likely, um, which comes from the Dasht collection, um, interestingly so, and which was put together by Tahir Al Jazairi because that was what he did to a large extent in Jerusalem. He didn't write a catalog as it was often claimed or anything else, but what he did, he was sitting in this fragment collection and was reconstructing uh, manuscripts and the Ibn Duraid um, manuscript that goes back to Ibn Tayyar al-Jazairi. And you still see the, the, the marks where he and pasted um, the, 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 the pages. So talking about critical and philological practices, that will be wonderful material um, as we have 20, um, uh, manuscripts and um, which which he puts together yeah um but overall one must say that the um manuscripts in the in the Khalidiyah library um are um severely damaged um if, if if you have a look at them in the in the hill um, catalog compared to collections um, elsewhere um let's say if you want to if you're looking for something in a museum exhibition what people love to see, you know, golden and um, two meters high and 
um, fancy um, leather um, bindings, etc. cetera, um, then I guess it's not where we will find many specimen um, in the Khalidiyah library. The Khalidiyah library, its importance, it's really that it is a living library, you know, not, not a library which was put together um, by a simple authority to, to, to display something, but this is really a living library where we still see library culture from the 19th century to a large extent, and um, with full respect to um, Ahmed's um, comments, um, the number of classical work is surprisingly low in that collection, you know, so, 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 so the great, you know, big authors um, are not there to an extent as one might have expected it today, but it's really rather copies from the 16th, 17th, 18th century, a lot of Scharf um, literature, um, what was really needed um, in the context of Ottoman Jerusalem. There, there is one thing I wanted to show, just you know, um, uh, for 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 the for the baraka of it. Here, there's a um, a uh, a manuscript from the Khalidia Library. It's an autograph. It's Taqiyad Din um, Asubki. Uh, so that's his handwriting, um, and that's uh, that made quite a splash um, because it was edited. It's a refutation of of, uh, of Ibn Taymiyyah's idea ideas. So people were very happy when they found it. They edited it. Uh, in uh, in the in the early 20th century, so so there are these autographs, there are these rare works, but uh, um, but uh, as Conrad said, the, the, there's there's no evidence that that the, the any member of the Khalidia uh, family was like um, a dedicated collector of specific type of auto of, of autographs. They just this one happened to to end up in this library. Um, Maybe on that note, we should uh, wrap it up for today and thank Conrad Hirschle for an amazingly interesting talk and Ahmed Shemsi likewise. I mean, uh, what a combination, you two. Uh, as I said, we'll come have you come back, I hope, and, uh, and, and greet us another time, maybe in reverse order. Um, but anyway, thanks very much. And um, we will, this is a good way to launch the Haradiyya readings as a series.